Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, February, 3rd, February 13th, 2018. On that day, we realized that over 500 packages that were booked over, uh, using our systems are going to the incorrect destinations. And uh, it sucked. And uh, uh, the ne next day, the Valentine's Day, it was not about the, our significant others. It was about making sure that the orders are heading to the, uh, the, the significant orders are heading to the, to the customers they, they, they paid for them. By Wednesday, I was well beyond 40 hours of work. Uh, so that cost me a lot of sleep and a lot, a lot of free time, but we survived because we acted fast. We contacted everyone that, was, that were involved and we, we figure out, figured thing, things out. But, uh, but we knew that there were things that should have been done differently and uh, certainly could have been done differently. Uh, can I have a show of hands who is attending their first ever Go conference? Okay, cool, very, very large number of people. Uh, I am speaking for the first time at the Go conference, so yay us. Uh, I won't be able to, know, uh, to get to know all of you, uh, although I would, I would love to, but I surely think that uh, you deserve to know a little bit, little bit about, about myself. So my name is Pavel Swonka. Uh, I do a couple of things. Uh, I have a blog called Michael Smells because it does. Um, I am a Go developer at Ingrid. I am a co-organizer and a regular speaker at our local uh, meetup called Go Wroc, it's located in Wrocław, Poland. Uh, I do uh, some sports. I run mar mar marathon twice, uh, and also I am a millennial. Uh, if you don't know who a millennial is, uh, it's a person that if you ask them a question, you, they don't respond to, the, to you directly. They spend the, an hour or two finding the perfect meme or a gif to, to <laughs> say exactly the same thing. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> okay, so uh, first of all, let us start the discussion with why do we write tests? I would say that there are three reasons why you might uh, consider it uh, the time being well spent. The first one would be to make sure that the code you are working on right now works. The second one is to make sure that the, work, that, that, that the code will work in the future, so that you can make some changes uh, and also allow other people to change your code because they are not fully aware of how it works, but if, with tests, they, are at least, uh, uh, they, can, they can check if the, the existing cases uh, pass as they should. And the third one would be to document the usage. So that, uh, so that people know how to uh, use your code and uh, what kind of inputs and outputs, inputs are allowed and the, how, what kind of outputs are expected. And uh, the longer it took, for you, it, it took for you to get bored uh, during that slide is basically the measurement of how selfish you are as a developer because the first one affects you, the second one affects your team and partially you, in the near future, and the third one affects other people because you basically don't need the documentation for the code you wrote because you know that it perfectly. But uh, who cares about uh, people in the future, right? Uh, but the question is, how it, uh, uh, why do we, do we talk about the, the, the test in general as a, something separate from production code? It's all, uh, after all, it's all uh, just code, right? So let us look at the life cycle of uh, both of those uh, types of codes. The first, uh, it's a production code. It starts, it's ra uh, rather obvious that you write your initial Im implementation of something. And then uh, what happens is uh, there is a popular, uh, popular uh, I don't know if you can say it's, say it's saying, but popular uh, phrase to say that the art of being a software developer does not lay in the, in the ability to write code, but in the ability to read code. And this is because you, you start by writing the code for the first time, but then you read it, and re you read it rep repeatedly, and you get used to the certain parts of your code base. You, if someone asks you how do we authenticate users, you know exactly uh, what is the call to the database, what is the in input, uh, how do you cache some stuff or, 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 or anything else. You, you even very often know exact service or uh, exact uh, function where this code lays. Why? Because you refactor it over and over and over again 
so that this particular piece of code grows as your team grows. How about test code? OK, you, we start the same because we write the initial implementation. And then we ask ourselves a, a question, uh, are they passing? If they do, if they are passing, you forget about them because they did their job. But uh, what, if you, what, what happens if you look at the tests and they are not passing? You ask yourself a lot of questions like, what the hell is that? Or who did it? Or how could it possibly uh, work at, at any point of the, uh, in the past? Or uh, like, uh, again, who did this? And you, you go get blame and say, OK, what was I thinking? And uh, <laughs> in the end, you say, that's, that's terrible. I'll rewrite it all, and then forget about it. Uh, forget about it. OK, uh, it's tough to, to speak about testing without mentioning TDD, uh, which is testing during deployment. But for some people, it's, <laughs> it's uh, test-driven development, for some of you, probably. Um, there's a, post a popular saying that TDD is dead or alive. Can I, again, have a show of, ha show of hands? Who thinks that TDD is dead? OK, I, have, I see some, some of you. Who thinks that TDD is alive? OK, so uh, you can't both be, be right. Some, some of you say that it's alive or dead, but so it, it turns out that it has, it has to be only one option, that it's a Schrodinger's TDD. <laughs> because it's both alive and dead, because no, uh, to be honest, nobody will convince you that this is, not, uh, this is otherwise uh, compared to, the, to what, is your, what is your approach. But let's, uh, let's dive, a bit, dive a, a bit deeper into it. Why could you say that uh, TDD is dead? First of all, it's so much effort. I perfectly know that my test, my, uh, my, uh, test will not pass because I don't have a function that, it's, that, uh, that I'm testing. And uh, so what is the point? The second one is, there is a certain feeling that if you write some non-trivial piece of code and it works perfectly on the first run, you say to yourself, that was good. That was awesome. It's a, rare, it's a very rare feeling, but, but it exists. And some, some, people, uh, some people cherish that moment. And the third one is that, uh, yeah, I didn't have enough time. Uh, that's, that's obvious that we don't have enough time. I mean, I never left early on Friday. I didn't go for the, for, to, that, to that long lunch on Tuesday. And uh, I spent the whole day from 9 to 5 working hard on this code. Uh, just just uh, barely squeezed the, the implementation, not the, the test. We didn't, we didn't have time for them. A quick sidetrack. Uh, who among you need a cup of coffee when they start your day? You, you don't leave, or you leave, your, you leave the house or you don't start working. Okay. <laughs> there, are a lot of, there, there are a lot of people, so I hope we don't run out of coffee. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, it will it'll be a sad, sad Friday sessions. Uh, OK, so what would happen if you come to the office and there is no coffee in the office? Uh, or, and the worst part is you forgot your wallet. You can't go to get any. What happens? You probably look like this. And uh, the question is, we can't just give up. I, I can't. Uh, uh, so what should you do if you, if you don't have coffee and you really need, really, re, re, you really need it? The, question, the answer is, go drop some database in production. <laughs> go break some stuff. Because trust me, I didn't need much coffee on, uh, in this, uh, on, this, uh, on this February night. If something is not working in production, you're will, you will going you will to fix it. And uh, you don't need caffeine, caffeine for that. OK, um, why would you say that TDD is alive? First of all, it helps you write the testable code, or actually, it makes you write testable code. Because if you write tests first and then the implementation of them, it's, it's, it's not possible to do it uh, the other way. What, what, uh, what is the consequence of that is that it makes you think about the code design. Because writing tests forces you to split your, your, your code in uh, separate packages, separate uh, maybe even services. It forces you to create some loose uh, coupling because you need to mock some some uh, some input. Uh, you don't you don't have them 
uh, so tightly together. Uh, the third one is that you are safe around TDD fanatics. And trust me, <laughs> this is an interesting thing. If you are someone who, uh, who does TDD and you walk around people that they don't, they say, that works for you, nice, cool, and they go back to, your, to, to work. If you are a person that does not and walk around people that they do, you are immediately the worst person in the world. Because everybody does TDD. If it's perfect, it's easy, it makes you, it, it gives you all the benefits. So look around and people that, that are smiling to you right now, they might think of you less if you tell them how little tests are you, are you writing. And the last part is, or maybe last but last on the slide, is uh, that it keeps you focused. And this is uh, something that I would recommend, this is uh, maybe the reason I would recommend TDD for, to everyone, not, maybe not to do it 100% uh, of the time, but it allows you to take a break without losing the, con the, the concentration. For example, you start by writing a test, and then you go for a break, you go for a cof coffee, for lunch, and then, and then you come back and you say, okay, so I was supposed to write the implementation to, to fix this issue or, this, uh, or, or satisfy this, this, uh, this test case. I will just do it. Uh, this is maybe counterintuitive, but it's a popular, or maybe not popular, but, my, uh, but uh, 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 maybe uh, interesting technique, to leave, leave for a day with a failing test. Because uh, it helps you get back on track uh, very fast uh, in the morning, but again, it's counterintuitive because we tend to finish our job before, you we, before we leave, or some of us do. And uh, I even uh, took, uh, took it to the extreme level this year. I left for a vacation with a failing test. Don't, uh, <laughs> that was not an important feature, don't worry. Uh, but yeah, but when I came back, I, to be honest, I forgot about that, uh, that, what I did. So I came back and said, what the hell is that? How, wh why, why something is wrong? And I, was, I almost started asking people around who, who broke this, but I realized that it was me. So yeah, again, get, get blame. Uh, but um, it helped, you, helped me get back on track very fast. And it's, uh, I, I, I believe that most of you have a problem with uh, getting back on track when you are uh, back from vacation. That was certainly the case for me, not this time. It, this time I saved, my, saved myself a lot of time. And this is maybe a less, little, little less, less dramatic version of breaking something on production, because if you see, uh, see a failing test, you try to, to fix it, uh, uh, because we just don't like the, the, red, uh, the, red, uh, the, 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 the red test screaming at us, unless you're not uh, coloring your, your test. So. Uh, OK, so. Why don't we write tests if we have some, so, much, so many benefits? First of all, we are lazy. And you can't fight with that, really. We are. So uh, The second one is writing tests is hard, and it's especially the first one. And the, 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 the part of, about the first one does not, uh, does not uh, Mm, say uh, it's not connected to the TDD because the TDD, uh, the first test is just as easy as the, all the rest. And it's, again, it's hard to argue with this uh, because if you, especially if you, uh, if you look at the code that, that doesn't have any tests, it's very often it's very hard and it takes a lot of time just to, to figure it out and to write the simplest ones. Uh, but it surely pays off. And also many, many people uh, I've heard saying you just can't test this. And uh, I would say that you can test everything. I might, I, I'm probably wrong, but uh, I would recommend you to, to be stubborn about this. Because if you just give up and you say, you, you know what, I can't test this, it's impossible, you're not going to do it. But if you say, but is there a way maybe you need to, switch, to alter some minor things or maybe alter some, some larger things, it may pay off. I, the, 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 the thing that happened for us in that February, that was a perfect case, uh, example of that. This, uh, right now we are laughing at, at us that, that we thought that it's not, in, not testable because it's pretty easy, but most of the team uh, joined when the, the particular functionality was already in place and there were no, no tests there and no, other, no, no one thought about, about doing it because it seemed complicated. Uh, yeah, and the third one is my favorite argument: the client didn't pay for them. Uh, really? Okay, so 
The question is, do you want to know, to your, uh, your client to tell you how, how to do your job? I don't, re, uh, re, I don't expect my client to tell me, okay, this is how the software, software development works. Um, you should do this and this and this, and I will pay for those. No, they are coming to you with some particular problem. They want it to be solved. And, it's, and, it's, uh, and, and if tests help you to achieve the, that goal, that is your responsibility to include it in the, in the process. And also, uh, this, uh, this argument is uh, used only uh, within the team. Uh, I don't imagine what would happen if we had a meeting on f in that February and it, I, we told uh, our clients, you know what, you should have paid for the tests, right? Because the, the package would, packages would be going to the, the, the correct uh, destination. So it's, it's not, not going to happen. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, I, uh, let's talk about the beautiful tests, which is probably a little bit too romantic. But if I was, uh, I, would, I would name this uh, like a plain test or ugly test, you will, you will have come. So, uh, yeah. So beautiful tests, in my mind, uh, uh, are built on with uh, like the, the have, have, have two main elements. The first one is test reports, and the second one is test body or the content. Uh, and the, the re test reports need to be readable. They need to give you enough information to debug any, uh, any potential issues, but don't uh, flood you with un unnecessary information. And then the feedback loop must be as fast as possible so that Mark is not uh, angry about, uh, about that. And the test body is just as a regular uh, production code. It has to be easy to be read and easy to be extended. Just to get everyone on the same page, this is how the, uh, the test looks. In Go, you, need, uh, you have a function, function starting with the word test. It takes one argument that is testing t. And this, the, that t is used to mark that the test is failing using the error or fatal or fail functions. You also can log some information. And basically inside, you call your function, you check, check if the output is what you expected. And then in this case, you return, you, not, you, uh, you uh, call that error function. You don't return an error, you just uh, just use that that helpers. So first, let's let us start with test reports or the way we run the tests. The first one would be uh, the test runner in Go allows you to use a flag called verbose, which uh, prints the log information for all the cases, regardless of whether they are passing or not. This is a, a some sample uh, sample code, which uh, sample code, sample maybe this this uh, this is how the test might look like. Uh, sorry for not handling errors here, uh, but uh, you can see that at each step of some uh, some workflow, you can log some information that might be important uh, to, to to see to to, to uh, debug the or, or see exactly why that the pass, the test passed or not. And if we run the test like regularly. Uh, we and if with two cases and one is passing and one does not, one's not, uh, you get the logs only for that one that uh, was incorrect. If you use verbose, you get logs for from all the test cases. And trust me, if you have a hundred of hundred of test cases, uh, it will be very hard for you to find uh, which one is failing. So uh, I would say I I, uh, I have a hard time figuring out when you would like to use verbose in, when running tests but I recommend you that you don't. The second one uh, maybe about the uh, fast feedback uh, is checking for race condition. And this is something that you, we shouldn't even argue about. Uh, this is a, this is a, a sample code that it's, if, if you are familiar, familiar, familiar with Go just a bit, uh, you can figure it out that it's, something is wrong because we have a one value that, uh, that is being attacked by multiple goroutines, and each goroutine tries to set uh, that value to some random, random integer. And what happens is if we run the test just like this with some, uh, some n, like 100 goroutines, it looks perfect. And we are so happy, we are ready to deploy to production, we are opening the champagne. Once it hits production, we have some problems. And uh, the solution is very simple. You just add the flag race to test runners, and it, it just being caught 
uh, this is just an no effort on your part, and then it saves you uh, maybe a lot of time and, uh, and worries once the code reaches production. Uh, another point is fl slow tests. And something, sometimes th it happens that your tests are slow, and not, it's, not, it's not because you're doing something wrong, but for example, you, have do, you are doing some heavy calculations, or you are, uh, you are having some uh, asynchronous logic, and you need to wait for something to happen. Uh, and you have a test that runs for three seconds. And uh, if you have 100 of tests like this, you just ba basically are waiting five minutes to see if the code you, are wrote, you wrote uh, is production ready. Uh, especially, for example, if, if you have uh, Git hooks that run the tests before every push. What you can do is you can, as uh, you already saw with race and with uh, verbose, you can also provide the test runner with your user, your, your uh, with the user-defined uh, uh, flags. And for example, if you know that a particular test, uh, test takes longer than, than, than others, you, just, you can skip them. And uh, for, it's perfect for your local development that you can have uh, the feedback loop, loop much faster. And then at the same time, you need to remember to have this flag, uh, have the, the test runner run all the tests on your CI so that it acts as a second line of defense and make sure that you don't actually break stuff. The, the, uh, another thing is uh, Go has uh, the feature with caching test reports. Uh, sorry, not test reports, but test results. And it's an awesome feature in most cases, not if you are uh, running integration tests like we are, uh, because if, with integration tests, the, the, the idea with, uh, about, with caching is that uh, if the, the test, the, if the code that is being run during the test does not change, uh, Go test runner assumes that uh, the test results would be the same. Uh, this is not the case for integration tests because the client side might not change, but the server side might certainly certainly change, and you don't have any uh, any changes uh, in the local uh, local environment. So to do that, to to make sure that the tests are running uh, at all times, you just use the flag count, which uh, forces the test runner to run those uh, at least once. Okay, um, now let's move to the body of the tests. Um, we all saw the, how the, the basic test work, uh, this test looks. What you can do is, the problem with, uh, with basic tests, uh, with those functions, is that if you add multiple test cases, and you, you prob probably, uh, probably are, uh, it grows, uh, and you have multiple, multiple functions for the, the test functions for some, some piece of functionality. What you can do is uh, use subtests, which is basically running tests inside of tests, and helps you to define some uh, common initialization logic, which is still uh, which is still local within the scope of the, the test function, and then you te run particular test cases for the happy path and the, the slightly less happy. Uh, what uh, what the problem here is that if you add another test case, if someone uh, comes along and and figures that that it, you need some uh, an, ad an additional check. The way they are checking the test case number four is up to them, and it's uh, maybe not re re readable for the, for the rest of the team. Uh, what, so what uh, I recommend is table tests, and they, they are structured very similarly. We, you have uh, some common initialization logic. You define the structs for the possible, for the structs for the input and the output. Then you define the values for them, and then you have one common block for checking whether the, this is correct or not. And this uh, forces uh, the, the, per the next person to, to check the fourth, uh, fourth uh, test case the same way we did with the pre previous three. And again, and also we are, uh, w since the subtests are using this, again, and they are using the testing, the, the, they have the uh, function with the testing T, they, are, they can be f uh, failing uh, on their own, so it's not like, uh, you fail the first test case and then you don't even check the second one because they are independent. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, the main reason for that would be to have these assertions uh, looking, look uh, as similar as possible for all the, all the cases. Speaking of, of assertions, that is, that it is a controversial topic in the Go community whether or not you should use an external, li external library. Uh, there are a couple of uh, probably most popular uh, you can also, the, the, the one camp says, go ahead and use them. The, the, the other says, no, you should do it uh, on your own. You run, 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 write a bunch of ifs. 
and uh, yeah, and own it. I would say either is fine as long as you stick to it, and especially if you have a team and you have a, like a, you make a collective decision that this is the way we 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 roll, because uh, there are uh, it's very difficult difficult for you if you are used for the particular way of of uh, of writing assertions or reading assertions, and then you go to the other part of this project and uh, you see it done completely differently. So. It's uh, totally up to you, and I think that both approaches are, are just fine. The other one is uh, golden files, which is if you are having a, a code that uh, is generating uh, files, please don't put the expected output uh, within the, 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 test, uh, the test file because it's very hard to read, and it's uh, especially if you have like uh, the files that can be easily uh, checked by human. Outside of the uh, outside of the, uh, not, not, they, they don't have to be like read by the computer. They can be read read by the by the person. Um, uh, in our case, we have the we generate so-called labels, which are the stickers that go on the packages, and they are uh, generated as the SVG files. And uh, uh, and yeah, and this is uh, again we we obviously check the contents of the SVG, but at the same time we can look at the at the file and see how it looks. Uh, because we have some uh, expected uh, expected uh, SVGs as in, inside our, our repos repository, and the name Golden Files uh, was used by Michael Hashimoto in one of his talks. And whenever you see a person that the community looks up to and speak about something that you are already using, you think to yourself, "Man, that could have been could have been me. I could have been the star." Uh, but also, obviously, uh, if, you, if someone, else, uh, someone else does something that you already do, it, uh, it like pro proves, your, proves your point. And also, having those files in, your, in the repository are a perfect way of documentation, because, uh, because again, if you have the, if someone, else, someone comes along and says, uh, how does this, does this sticker look for a particular tra transportation product? We don't need to search for some last calls on the production. We just go to the test and say, okay, this is the one that is filled with all the information. Uh, so this is, the, this is what, you, you, what you, you may expect. Mocking. Mocking is important when, we are, you know, when you are writing unit tests and especially when you have loose coupling. Um, I would recommend that you should make your mocks as dummy as possible uh, because it, re it helps you read the code. If you have a mock mm, that, uh, that returns some value, you just create the, the, the mock with uh, expected, expected uh, responses uh, and then make it uh, return them as uh, all the time. What I've been guilty, guilty of over time is writing two smart mocks which look basically like this. If we have an input like this, you have the output, the, the, this output, and uh, and uh, and uh, for different different cases, and then for the number three, uh, this cause it returns an error because this is something that I was using in our in my tests, and this is very very hard to read, especially if you even if you are, uh, I mean uh, during the the, the 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 development it's perfect because you know that three will not work, but after a month or two you will not remember anything, uh, so yeah. If you if you just create a mock that always returns what you tell them ex explicitly to do, it's much much easier to read. Also, I recommend something that I call request awareness or request memory. Uh, is that uh, you you create a, a, an additional field in the mock that's called in my case uh, it's always called requests, and this is the way you can check if the the API of the mock was called or not, or or, or what are the what were the uh, the, uh, the the request, the, the parameters that were that the, that the, the that the endpoint the, the API was called with, you can do it as a slice of uh, the the request or a slice of strings, depending on whether or not or not you have a, a different uh, different input types for the mock. And this is, for example, the perfect way to check uh, if your if your for example the API client was called. Uh, uh, depending on whether or not there was already a value in cache. So you can uh, check that, that the request is uh, slice empty. And uh, last but not least, the check functions, which is my favorite way of writing tests. And I'm surprised that uh, I haven't heard about them uh, anywhere since this is taken from the standard library from the HTTP test package. 
uh, for me, and I've heard uh, the feedback from many people, uh, they are easy to read and easy to be extended, so per they fit my previous slide perfectly. No, it's, uh, and uh, what, what happens is you start by identifying the, the function that, function that you, want, you want to test. We have a do stuff that takes some input and then returns stuff and error. And this, what, what is being returned is most important because what you do now is you, is you create a check function which takes as an input parameters what, whatever is being returned plus the testing T which will be used, uh, which, you, which, is, which is also critical for the check function to be, to be uh, independent. And what happens now is you create a fac uh, the, the functions or a factory of functions uh, that say basically that uh, has error and we have some expected error. And then uh, inside we call, uh, we return the, the check function uh, in, uh, uh, which will fail or not re uh, depending on the error being what we expected or not. We can also uh, create multiple checks like has no error or has specific uh, result or has uh, any results, for example, if, you re if we are returning slices. Uh, and this is also, if you look into the, the HTTP test package, this, the, there is a, ha a smart hack there, which I, well, I'm also using most of the times, is that the shorthand function, so that you don't have to type the brackets and check uh, and create the slices manually, because it's so much work. Um, you just have the function that, uh, it's a var arc function, so that you can define those check functions as a comma separated list. And what you end up with, if you are doing, uh, if you are naming those functions correctly, and if you are naming your test cases correctly, you finish up with a test case, that, a test function that looks like looks like this. And if you focus uh, uh, in the, the basically the the perfect usage of a check functions in the in the um, table test, for, uh, f in, the, in the perfect usage, you focus on the middle part only because you don't really uh, need to look um, uh, in the what is the input and uh, how the checks are being done? Because by the way, the last part is always looks the same. You iterate over the checks and check if and call them and expect them to fail or fail the test or not. But if you have uh, everything well thought of, you just read the middle part and you say that if the input is invalid, I expect the error to be error invalid input. And this is basically it. It's very easy to be extended because uh, first of all, uh, first of all, uh, maybe maybe the most important thing is that uh, you don't need to check for the whole, the, the whole response from the function. For example, you have uh, some service, some call that always returns an entity with a non-empty ID. If uh, with a regular approach, you just need to create the, 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 response, the, uh, the response object, and you always need to, to put that ID in. In this case, you don't need to do that because, if you, because it's enough that you have one test case that checks for the, the, the non-empty ID and the, the next cases can, can focus on something else. And also, um, when the new requirement presented, pre presents itself, um, you just can, you can f focus on checking that particular, particular piece, not uh, forcing yourself to uh, to, to again check the, the stuff that you've already checked. So to sum up, I would like to make a call to action uh, to write the tests to save your sleep, to write the tests to save your free time, and to do that for the people that come, come after you. Uh, because after all, I think that we all want to be able to just log off, close the lid of our laptops and go home, not worrying about our tests being broken on production and causing some uh, any issues for the customers. Yes, please do that. We all want, th want that. I certainly wanted that on that long, long and cold February night. Thank you. Do we have time? Yeah, we don't have time. Okay, so since we, since, we, since we don't have... We can do two questions. Two questions. I need a microphone. Yep. Do we need a microphone? Does anybody have a microphone on them? Oh, this guy does. Thank you. Wasn't that convenient. Okay, we've got time for two questions. Okay. Let's go right down here. Someone up front. Good. Have you tried using mutation tests? Sorry? Have you tried using mutation tests? Uh, no, no. I, okay. I have no experience. So no. 
Okay, that was a good question. <laughs> I love short, sweet questions. Love it. Uh, okay, we got somebody else over here. Raise your hand again. There you go. So I can see you. Hi. Um, for the subtests and the initialization for that, do they share initialization state between the subtests? So if I start a, a thing with state in it and the first subtest changes the state, does the second subtest have that state or does it reinitialize itself? Uh, for example, if you have a, a, a slice in the initialization and you change the slice, you, it's changed for all, all the uh, cases. Yeah. So. So basically, if you have something that uh, that might be changed, uh, you you move this. I I I, I at least move this uh, this part to the the, the right. checking part. So, so cool. yeah. right. Okay, our first question was answered really quickly, so we could probably do one more question. Anybody else have a question? No, no, no. Apart from when am I going to stop talking? No. Okay. Pavo, thank you thank so you. much.